Welcome to Press Coverage. I'm Theo Greminger. And uh, at Press Coverage, I'm looking to bring you the sharpest guests, and I want to find the best angles to help you win with your fantasy teams. And this time of year, we're in must-win mode. This is week 13. The fantasy playoffs are right around the corner. You're hopefully playing for a bye week, and your team's in great shape. For some of you, you're fighting for your playoff lives. Um, and for some of you, you're, you're playing for pride at this point and looking to be a spoiler in your leagues. But week 13, we also have to deal with the dreaded six-game bye week. So I'm bringing in I'm bringing in a sharp one. I think the the young the young kids would say that that Jim Coventry of Rotowire is sharp AF. Um, the guy really knows his stuff. He watches all the games. He, he he this is not our first rodeo. Jim and I at this point have podcasted together a number of times. Uh, a lot of you who watch First Class Fantasy, Jim and Alan Soslowski of Rotowire both came on First Class Fantasy, crushed it. I've had a chance to go on on Jim's podcast on Rotowire. But Jim's putting out fantastic stuff, not only in the podcast, but also in the YouTube streets. Jim, welcome to Press Coverage, and why don't you let everybody know uh, where they can find your work? Yeah, everything goes through the X Hub at Jim Coventry NFL. You always find what I have going. But um, weekends, if you have Sirius XM Fantasy Channel eighty seven on Saturdays one to three with Mario Puig, Sundays nine to ten with Alan Soslowski. That's one great place to find me. Otherwise, RotoWire Fantasy Football Live. It's a YouTube show five days a week, off Wednesday and Thursday. Again, eleven a.m. That's always on the X. I post that there. Otherwise, all my stuff's at RotoWire. Yeah, no, and I highly recommend Jim's work. Uh, you know, he's I, when I first when I first listened to Jim, um, looks like years back, and then I heard you with Billy Muzio, and I'm like, I got to get that guy on. I got him on a goat district, and now we just keep on rocking. So always enjoy our time getting a chance to talk to one another. Um, and I think this week it's really important to have somebody like you because we we're hitting getting hit with like a lot of information. Um, and we got to find the angles to kind of sift through what's real and maybe what was kind of a one week game specific. But, you know, last night, um, you know, I'm in the DMs talking about the show, giving you the show sheet. And like anything in fantasy football, we got to throw that completely out the window because we get a news bomb yeah. like this morning. I'm I'm, in, I'm at the, the, the gym and I look at my phone and I get I see like a, a Schefter bomb that, you know, Jonathan Taylor has a thumb injury, which we knew about from this weekend, but it says the word, his his future's in doubt. They they use the word in doubt, which makes me think that the, like the worst and some sort of structural thing or God knows when it comes to something as complex as the thumb. Some people are like, you know, it's just a thumb. Why don't you tape it up and play? But I don't, I'm not going to get into the medical side of this, but Jim, what are your thoughts, your panic level? Uh, and what kind of impact Jonathan Taylor missing games would have on the Colts offense, namely Zach Moss and then the wide receivers we like in, in Michael Pittman and Josh Downs. This is tough with Jonathan Taylor because, well, he got paid already, so there's that. So at least this is this case where I'm going to sit down to preserve my value, but we don't know the severity of the thumb. And we, hey, many years back, DeMarco Murray, I remember, they just – put something on his hand and didn't use him as much in the receiving game. And they just handed the ball and he did his job, but other players get shut down. So we're going to have to unfortunately anxiously wait to see what the circumstance is. Um, I would imagine if the thumb is a problem and he can play, then he's still going to cede more work to Zach Moss than he had, but there is a real chance he misses time. But again, we don't have too much to go on here, but if Taylor is out, we already saw it from a production standpoint. Zach Moss produced better than Jonathan Taylor in that same role. And it wasn't like a new thing. Last four weeks of last season, Zach Moss is doing the same thing. Yeah. And it's, we talked about Zach Moss last time we were on weeks and weeks ago, talking about whether or not he would kind of retain his fantasy value with Jonathan Taylor returning. And you bring up the beginning of the year and it's so quick that we kind of forget Zach Moss was not only putting up strong running back numbers, but he was putting up like like weak winning ones. He had a 20.7 uh, point, point week, a 22 point week, a 33 point week, an 18 point week. And then he had the like a, the weird Jonathan Taylor returns, uh, you know, production and he got you another 14 point week. And then this week with Taylor, he gets you 55 yards rushing to go with 15 receiving yards. So like Zach Moss has been a Shane Steichen guy all year long. And Zach Moss, if you have Zach Moss, 
you never root for injuries, but there's a reason that we roster handcuff running backs. And there's a reason that we continually say, like, when Jonathan Taylor returned, there were people asking whether they should cut Zach Moss. And it's like, at the very least, Zach Moss is the best handcuff, if not one of the best handcuffs uh, in fantasy football. So um, it's two ways of looking at it. If you have Jonathan Taylor, your panic level is awful. Um, you also have the, I think your scenario of some sort of a split because he's limited in workload is almost a nightmare for, for Taylor managers, because if you are able to sit him and put in a viable uh, option, if he misses the game outright, that's almost better than let's say he plays and they say, you know, Zach Moss is running the ball. Well, let's just use JT on the goal line if we need to, or maybe not use him on the goal line at all. Cause we're, right. we're dumb and you get like a, a 40% JT, 60% Zach Moss, and you're stuck with like nine fantasy points. So I think there's a lot of nightmare scenarios. What about, take a step back, let's say Jonathan Taylor misses. Do you anticipate increased opportunities for like a Michael Pittman or a Josh Downs or about the same? Well, I think, Theo, we already saw it earlier in the season. This yeah. offense does not change a bit. It doesn't matter if it's Zach Moss. It doesn't matter if it's Jonathan Taylor. T Taylor's faster in theory, but we haven't seen the big explosive runs. So realistically, it is the same offense. And one last point on the Taylor and Moss, if they both play thing, I think where Taylor would take the biggest hit would be on passing downs. And he had been getting targets. I think with a thumb as the injury, I don't think we're seeing him on passing downs. You don't want him in pass pro more than you have to. And you certainly don't want to trust him catching the ball with a thumb injury. So that I want to add that, but the offense, otherwise, no, this stays the same. Yeah, it's definitely one to monitor and hopefully something that we have uh, like more information about, you know, very quickly. Um, and then, you know, we got to talk about last night as well. Last night, Chicago won their first NFC North game uh, since 2021. And we talked in the pre-show, Jim, the last time we saw Chicago win an NFC North game was against at that time, like an 0-10 Detroit Lions team. So how quickly you know, things change in the NFL where the Lions are like a lock uh, fantasy playoff team and we've had like an opposite trajectory for Chicago. But, you know, there was a lot of kind of fantasy takeaways here. I mean, we'll talk about Minnesota, but for Chicago, we've got to be excited about the DJ Moore-Justin Fields connection. DJ Moore gets his fourth 20-plus point uh, PPR scoring week of the season. And that he's actually averaging over 20 points per game in games attached to Justin Fields. So for better or for worse, the DJ Moore is yet another wide receiver to switch teams in the offseason, get into a better situation, and hit. The only difference with DJ Moore is we had those missing weeks with uh, Tyson Tyson Bajan where he was like a low-end wide receiver three. So uh, that's my takeaway. It's just how confident I am in DJ Moore uh, for the rest of the season. What are your takeaways, Jim? Because we talked a little bit about Roshan Johnson, and I think that Roshan is one which I know a lot of us at Player Profiler, including myself, are excited about Roshan as a potential waiver wire addition for many fantasy managers this week. But you have some apprehension there. I do. So first of all, let's tie it in with the DJ Moore point you made. DJ Moore has at least 96 yards in five of the last six games he played with Justin Fields. The game he didn't get the 96 yards was the first meeting against Minnesota. In that game, nobody was really ready for Brian Flores' defense. They do one of two things. They either will send a comprehensive blitz package, and it doesn't look the same every time. So they compromise the pressure. Or at the snap, they drop out and drop eight. And so now you're either throwing into a wall of people or you're running for your life as a quarterback. But the problem is you don't know when it's coming and not, so you're playing frenetic as it is. So in the rematch, what do the Bears do? Okay, we have to protect Justin Fields. Normally he might scramble out, but the blitzes come from all over, so they're going to hem him in. So we have to play Roshan Johnson, the pass protector. And he's an outstanding pass protector. So Roshan Johnson, easily as high as snap percentage, 74% of the snaps to 21 for Khalil Herbert. Herbert can't protect the passer. My thought was in this game, it was completely game specific because of what Brian Flores' defense brings to the table. And then the Bears, of course, got a lot of bubbles and quick outs to DJ Moore to, again, mitigate the two factors of either the drop eight or the pressure. So it to me, it was surprisingly from Chicago, a good game plan. 
Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll take kind of an in between here. Like, I'm still going to add Roshan Johnson because it's a horrendous waiver wire week. And I think if you've already added Roshan Johnson, you've at least seen him be successful catching the football. So I don't know, Jim, because for me, it's when these Tim teams go on bye weeks, I think they oftentimes self scout. And I don't think they necessarily know their plan at the running back position. You also have the fact that Deonta Foreman was so successful. Does Deonta Foreman come back and just make this a backfield that's even even like gnarlier, where we get a little bit more Roshan Johnson, we still have Khalil Herbert mixing in, and then we get a Deonta Foreman? I think realistically, all the scenarios are there. I think it is worth spending the money on, or excuse me, spending the fab on Roshan because, hey man, we're at the end of the season and there's just no other viable uh, running back waiver wire additions in a lot of leagues this week. So uh, definitely one uh, that remains to be seen. Now on the flip side of the ball, we got to talk about Josh Dobbs because Josh Dobbs, the pastor not, when he first arrives, he gives you that 25 point week where he has 66 yards rushing a touchdown, gives you two more touchdowns passing. It's like this incredible story where he fills in for Hall who leaves the game with an injury and he doesn't even know his linemen's names and he's like working on his cadence on the sideline and they end up winning the game and he plays well. Then the next week gives you even more passing yards, has like 270, rushes for another touchdown. So there was people victory lapping Josh Dobbs and talking about Josh Dobbs not only as you know one of the waiver wire ads of the season, but a guy who could realistically be like found money for the Vikings franchise and their long-term answer at quarterback. And when you watch Josh Dobbs in those games, you said, how on earth was this guy a backup quarterback for so many seasons? And then you end up watching last night and you're like, okay, I get it. Dobbs has four interceptions. He does find TJ Hawkinson on a big touchdown late, but it wasn't enough. They lose the game. And now you have Minnesota saying that they're going to examine everything during the bye week. I mean, Jim, some of his misses were just awful. He had Jordan Addison wide open, Mm -hmm. completely misses him, like leads him out of bounds uh, on a pass. So where are we at with Josh Dobbs? Do you think this is a – is this an aberration week or is this a week where they have a chance to, during their bye week, get it together, Dobbs ends up getting Justin Jefferson back in week 14, and we see a little bit more like we are used to in like weeks eight and nine, or do you think this is something that – Moving forward, you're worried. There's a mixed portrait here. So first of all, Josh Dobbs was a backup quarterback for a reason. And he did really well with Arizona. And he goes to Minnesota. They have an amazing offensive line. They're up near the top in pass blocking, run blocking. and But now, of course, no Jefferson. His targets were merely decent. But I think what film shows out on Josh Dobbs is this. First of all, he is comfortable playing to his right. The more film that gets out on him. Now, for those who are older in the audience, there was a man named Rick Myrer, who was a Notre Dame graduate. And he was with the Seattle Seahawks, had an amazing rookie season for that time in that era. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim. I'll show you my age. Rick Myrer was the same draft as Drew Bledsoe. That's correct. Okay, Stretch. there you go. That's correct. Go. So, Rick Myrer, the tape came out on him, the same deal with Dobbs. He could do great to his right but he's lost to his left. And so defenses overplayed the side of the field, and he was pretty much a backup or out of the league very soon after that. Well, Josh Dobbs, it's he's either rolling to his right or he's mostly looking for the tight end. Comfortable middle of the field throws. He's thrived in these situations. Uh, can occasionally make some plays again when he's going to his right. Well, the Bears come in, and we'll give the Bears a little credit here too. The Bears, first of all, remember the Broncos earlier in the season. They play Miami and they get pasted, lay up 70. Now their season long numbers look terrible. They are playing at a much higher level. The Bears are in a similar boat. The last few weeks, especially since p- picking up Montez Sweat, this defense has an emotional boost. They are playing faster. They are flying to the football. The secondary has played improved football because the Bears have improved their overall pass rush and they don't have to quite cover as long. So Dobbs was kind of blindsided here, but the holes in his game are real. Now, here's where the mixed portrait comes in. Will Justin Jefferson's return change that? Because if Jefferson's back on the field, defenses will be 
not so inclined to bring as much pressure as Chicago did yesterday because you have more to worry about. Ultimately, Addison's a very good player, but defenses aren't losing sleep over him yet. And Hawkinson, okay, throw underneath. So it was a mixed picture, but the Jefferson return complicates what we can expect from Dobbs going forward. I'm nervous right now for sure, but there is potential for a little bit of an increased production because of Jefferson. And it's to me the the whole like we're looking into things at every position, like it's a little to put a little pressure on Dobbs. But you don't for do you foresee a scenario where Minnesota switch makes a switch at the quarterback position? I think that would be very reactionary and an incredibly big surprise. I think it's kind of nonsense these reports. But what what are your thoughts on that, Jim? Going into the season, Nick Mullins was their backup. He was on IR. He's been since activated from IR. He's the number two at this point. Uh, He he understands the game. He understands Kevin O'Connell's offense, but his ability level would significantly limit them. I think Josh Dobbs has done enough before the Chicago game for them to not go to Nick Mullins. Nick Mullins does not give them any increased ceiling where at least we know Dobbs often can get it done on the ground. He could figure out a way. He's limited, but he's less limited than Nick Mullins. I I don't think that that's a move that can help them win. Yeah, it would be the ultimate galaxy brain, like play a guy who knows my system, system versus talent scenarios, and those rarely work out uh, in in any level of football, let alone uh, the NFL. We got a lot more to talk about from week 12, and then we want to talk about some guys moving forward uh, you know, regarding the fantasy playoffs uh, after we hear a word from our sponsors. This episode brought to you by Mojo. Mojo is that player stock market. We love Mojo because we like making lifetime bets on players. You run out the clock on these guys. Mojo just rolled out a brand new fantasy platform. That's right. So now you can build a portfolio of player props. Oh, Jamar Chase over 77.5. Oh, Kadarius Tony under 15.5. Whatever the under is on Kadarius Tony, it doesn't matter. You can just stack up the props in your portfolio. And the beauty is once the Sunday games kick off, it's not over. It's not over until it's over with Mojo because once those games kick off, you can then move in and out of positions. Let's say that you're well ahead of expectations. You can cash out. Let's say you're behind expectations. You're underwater. Well, you can double down. That's what makes Mojo so special, why they're different. Check it out. Go to the App Store. Get the Mojo app and use the promo code UNDERWORLD. The promo code UNDERWORLD gets you a 100% deposit match up to 100 bucks. So the promo code is UNDERWORLD and they will match your deposit dollar for dollar. Go to Mojo, start building your portfolio, and then during the games, you can be a fantasy day trader. Welcome back to Press Coverage. I'm Theo Greminger, and I'm joined by Jim Coventry of Rotowire. And Jim, you know, a lot of times this this time of the season, when you get to, you know, the week 12, week 13, week 14 and beyond, it's when we start seeing some of these breakouts for these younger wide receivers, thinking back to A.J. Brown's rookie season, D.K. Metcalf's rookie season, Amon Ross St. Brown's rookie season. There's been a number of these sort of players that, catch fire towards the end of the year and guys who maybe in the first half of the year we looked at as maybe a flex and then they turned into a locked in starter and a a league winner type is Rasheed Rice one of those guys I mean Rasheed Rice Rice comes off of the best game he's ever had as a pro he was wide receiver three overall in the week gives you eight catches for 107 yards and a touchdown people are starting to get very excited about Rasheed Rice. I tweeted out that I think he's headed towards the fifth round, like the five, six turn of redraft next year. And I had a couple of people t- saying, Theo, you're a little bit too low on that. He looks really good and they're using him kind of in very smart ways. What are you seeing out there with Rice, Jim? So yes, he's very good at navigating zone defense. And when you have Patrick Mahomes as your quarterback in a zone heavy league, you're going to see more zone than not. And so having players that can A, find the gaps in the zone and B, put themselves in position to get yardage after the catch by angling their bodies properly. Yes, Rasheed Rice is showing some of that ability. It still blew me away that coming out of the bye in week 11, 
the answer against Philly was let's throw Justin Watson the ball 11 times. In my mind, that was a doomed plan. Andy Reid, I thought was, you know, I mean, again, he knows a billion times more than I do, but to come out of the bye and say, we're not going to make it about Rashi Rice. We're going to make it about Justin Watson. Of course you lost the game. Now you come back and finally get him 10 targets in a game. Oh, hundred yards and a touchdown. Surprise, surprise. I, I just didn't understand even before the bye, he had a two target game, got his catch, touchdown catch early, heard nothing from him, but the snap share, it's basically been about 65% in most games. The only game it wasn't the game out of the bye was about 57. But yes, he is a player. The more chemistry he gets with Mahomes, that is the critical key. Because I mentioned earlier about the zone, the zones they face. Mahomes will gain more and more comfort the more Rice is successful. And so, yes, I do think this is a player on a huge meteoric rise. And right now, if he sees increased uses down the stretch. I do think he'll go before the fifth round. Yeah, it's it's wild. You have the Mahomes factor. You have the draft capital factor. He's got the size. And we've been looking for kind of an heir apparent to Tyreek Hill as a wide receiver one in this Kansas City offense now for two seasons. You know, you had the Kadarius Tony, the hopes of fantasy managers. And, and Tony got into like that sixth round in redraft. Uh, so like... If Tony can get there, I think you're right. I think Rice might go even higher. I think he's going to be one of those guys this offseason that fantasy managers are like, I need to leave my draft with Rasheed Rice. Uh, a lot of people love drafting those second-year wide receivers as well. And then regarding Kansas City, I think it's all coming together for their offense. You have the balance now with the strong running back production from Isaiah Pacheco, Travis Kelsey being Travis Kelsey, and now Rasheed Rice being like a plus 20% target share guy every single week and another touchdown threat. So you got to like what you're seeing out of this Kansas City offense. And let's pivot over to the running back position, though, because, you know, we got to get it in because we're, we're, we're not going to hit the whole show sheet, Jim. This this We're, hit, we're get, doing too well here today, uh, elaborating on some of these small topics. But one topic that is not small is Kyron Williams. Kyron Williams we hear these reports that he's going to be limited. We want to be slow with him. Sean McVay gave every indication that there was going to be some sort of a, maybe a snap count, protect Kyron Williams. Fantasy managers had great production from him earlier in the season. The He gave you 158 rushing yards in against Arizona in week six, then gets injured, sent to the IR, misses all these games. Week 12 was circled on the, on the, on the map. So, you had him in your lineup, but you kind of probably tempered expectations this week. He ends up giving you 143 rushing yeah. yards. Then he gives you six catches for 61 yards and two touchdowns. Unbelievable. Kyron Williams looks like he could be the league winner. The Rams are very much in the mix in the NFC uh, for a wild card spot. And his return also seemed to kind of open up the offense and balance everything out. Matt Stafford passes for four touchdown passes and that's with Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup doing nothing so basically your thoughts on Kyron Williams and what you're seeing from this Rams offense moving forward Jim so Kyron Williams has at least 24.6 PPR points in all but two games that right. is incredible undrafted in almost every fantasy league but what the Rams have done Sean McVay he is a genius. He, he figures out different ways to adjust to what the league has going against him. We remember back in the Todd Gurley days, they were doing zone run and they were using the running back in the receiving game. And it was hyper successful. Well, in this version of the league with the zone defenses running what we call duo, it's a downfield rushing attack that is one of the answers to attacking the zone defenses and Kyron Williams has been a perfect scheme fit with the duo run concepts they're using in Los Angeles obviously they've also integrated him as a receiver so double threat and the goal line work he has been very heavily used at the goal line now this game it happened to be receiving work but he was getting it done on the ground so right now yes he is going to see an incredible snap share. The defenses will always have to worry about Matthew Stafford and the passing attack. So we're not going to see teams come in, load the box. Hey, we have to stop Kyron Williams because even though Cooper Cup hasn't been 
over uber productive. You've still got him. You've still got Nakua. You have a passing game to worry about. Defenses have to play them straight. So yes, Kyron Williams, volume production. He's a top five running back going forward. Yeah, no, I'm completely there with you. Now, how about Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua? Uh, just in terms of your expectations, like Cup gets five targets, which I'm taking it as Cup was banged up. We didn't necessarily know that Cup was going to play until a few days before the game. They announced he's back, and he only ends up with five targets. Do you think this was sort of a, a product of they ended up winning the game by 23 points, and also maybe Cup was somewhat limited in what he could do in his first game back? Uh, do you have any sort of like volume concerns for Cup, or do you think this is most games like, you know, Higby gets two touchdown catches, Atwell gets 75 yards, kind of a little bit of an aberration with the other guys. Do you have any concerns with Cup? I mean, look at Cup's last four games, and I know one of them had a backup quarterback. Two for 29 and seven targets. Four for 21 and 10 with a backup quarterback. Yeah, What did he have, a one for set? No, yes. one for 11 against yeah. Seattle? Uh, 27% of the snaps, okay? So he got hurt, and that one limped out an ankle. But again, and then the three for 18 this week. Right now? something's not working in this offense. And it's not like because Cup's not getting it, Puka Nakua is. Nakua, when Cup went out with the ankle, ends up with 70 yards and a touchdown. But other than that, Nakua had three games under 30 yards. So right now, and we saw Daryl Henderson and Royce Freeman producing when they were in, not to the level of Kyron Williams. So right now, it looks like their defense is playing enough. I mean, they, they can get torched in the pass game. But I think they want to control some clock. I think they want to try to keep the defense off the field. They're going to run the ball and they're going to throw enough, but with cup, not getting like all the targets. And right now the offense passing game is not going crazy. We had four touchdowns last week, yeah. but Stafford only threw for two twenty nine. That was a blowout win, but no, this passing game is not going right now. And it's like, if somebody's asked me Coop or Nakua, who do I start? Cup or Nakua? I'm saying, well, start cup, but they both have floors. And I, I trust Cup to get it done more. I don't trust either of them right now. Yeah, it's interesting. I think this time of year, I think that's a that's a really an interesting like fantasy game theory uh, argument is a lot of times early in the season, we talk about like a sunk cost fallacy with if a guy's not delivering, but you drafted him in like the fifth or sixth round, don't be afraid to bench him. That's how you lose games by just playing these guys, hoping it's going to turn around. When you start seeing guys declining in their production as the season moves along and you have viable alternatives on your bench, oftentimes when we're talking about like a one-week season, especially for the fantasy playoffs, I don't want to bet on a guy having his best game in five games if I have a viable alternative behind him. You also have to factor in the age of Cooper Cup and the injuries that he's sustained. He's sustained a bunch of them at this point, Jim, and they this kind of starts to catch up with, with you, you know, maybe in the off season, he heals up and we see, you know, old Cooper cup for another season next year, but we might be seeing, you know, the decline of him. Uh, and we talk about Puka Nakua and how his productions kind of wavered of late. I know he had the touchdown last week, but you have some concerns about him as well, maybe a little less. Um, but one rookie who is absolutely in fuego is tank Dell. And we see, the Houston Texans lose a game to the Jaguars and they also only scored 21 points, but it, it was like a beautiful consolidation where CJ Stroud gets you three touchdowns, gets you a rushing touchdown, two passing touchdowns. You get through the week with CJ Stroud, pretty happy. Another 300 yard passing game for CJ Stroud. Then you get Nico Collins giving you a seven catch hundred yard game scores a touchdown, but tank Dell does it again. He has five catches for 50 yards uh, and a touchdown, but this could have been a massive game. He had a really long completion called back and he was missed on another one. This could have been like another 150 yard game for Tank Dell. He looks every bit the real deal. Nico Collins is playing great. CJ Stroud is continually putting up fantasy points. Where are you at on this passing game trio? I mean, how confident are you in this group of Texans? You know, I was very anxious to watch the game between the Texans and the Jaguars because this was the first time 
that we saw a team in a rematch against them. Stroud had burned the Jacksonville defense. Now the Jacksonville defense may not be world beaters, but they're they're quite good. They're yeah. they're they're solid average above average defense. So I was interested to see how they would come out and prepare for this game. And look, Houston only scored 21 points. But Houston passed this test of flying colors because with adjustments made, the fact that Stroud was still able to get his stars the ball, that is that sign for CJ Stroud. That's the superstar sign. When so you see somebody's change up or their reaction and you have an answer for it. So that is incredible. Now, Tank Dell, I, I still try to get my mind around 5'8, 165, only like a four, like a four four seven. He's for his size, that's a slow speed. Like he should be running. He's like below the median percentile. Well, he's just a football player. And that's what happens sometimes. Anything we see, any numbers we have, what college production was, sometimes you just get in the right spot and you are an outlier. You are just this football player. And the fact that he won and he got open in the front of the end zone on a scramble play with his size, it's like, how does somebody like not get in his way? But yet this man knows how to perform. I look, Theo. Right now, it's going to be really hard for me to rank him outside of the top 20 receivers each week. And that might oh, yeah. not be enough. That might not be enough. But it's still like, at some point, is it, look, I want to make one point here, Theo. Tank Dell is making big play after big play, right? This is a league that Jamar Chase took by storm a few years ago with big play after big play. The league with the two high shells, they were able to limit most of Jamar Chase's big plays. His damage now is coming underneath intermediate stuff. He, he isn't getting consistent downfield passes. The league took Jamar Chase mostly away from that. I have to think that next year when the league resets on a player, the league is really bad with in-season adjustments on single players. But if they could take away Jamar Chase's big play ability on a regular basis, you have to think they could do it to tank out. It'll be very interesting because you know you bring up the speed of four four seven. When you watch him, though, he's it's one of those guys that plays yep. faster in pads and maybe doesn't necessarily test well in the forty because he looks like a four three guy out there. You right. Know, w w uh, our, one of our colleagues here uh, on our podcasting network, um, you know, is Jax Falcone uh, of the Undrafted, who I think when it comes to dynasty is one of the sharpest guys out there. Scott Bollinger, aka, um, but he's been with saying the name Tyree Kill. And it's kind of like when Tyree Kill came into this league and was just different. And Tank Dell's doing it in different ways, but the ability to continually burn NFL defenses, make big plays, have these huge 20-plus point weeks. I mean, right now, from a rookie perspective, Tank Dell's having one of the best rookie seasons of all time. Mm -hmm. for, um, you've, he's, he's probably the best third-round NFL draft pick rookie since like Keenan Allen. Um, and he's not hitting quite Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson rookie year numbers. Those guys were like high 17 points per game, but he's averaging more points per game than Jalen Waddell, who was a borderline wide receiver one as a rookie. He's averaging more points per game than Amon Ross St. Brown, who was a league winner. And he's averaging more points per game significantly than Garrett Wilson, who was the uh, offensive rookie of the year. And he's not going to hit the Odell Beckham Randy Moss rookies levels like he's not there but at the end of the day when you're talking about the best 20 rookie wide receivers of all time Tank Dell and also Puka Nakua are going to be there so he'll be an interesting one that we're talking about like all summer long Jim I think that there'll be a wide kind of like range here of where people are going to be willing to push Tank Dell uh in drafts because this guy's terrific yes talk about Nico Collins though Nico Collins also is is really shining um and the two seem to really complement each other very well you know nico collins is a classic nfl alpha you'll line him up on the single side of the formation on the line of scrimmage he'll take on the the you know the press man coverage and he can consistently win and he he also showed signs in his first two years he definitely is a contested catch winner he's a strong red zone receiver but bringing in the bobby slowick offense has given him more opportunities to get diagonal to run more slant routes across the field get his big body and traffic schemed open quickly and he had a little bump in the road after the first hot start to the season but now it's kind of gotten figured back out coaches like bobby slowick are good at making micro adjustments for their players when collins had not been performing defenses were playing him a little more physically 
they find ways as the San Francisco hybrid offense to find the receiver opportunities to get open. And Collins is that dominant receiver. And so, yes, the numbers he's posting seven for 65, not great. Seven for 104 to touch on last week. That is, these are the types of games we should consistently get from him. And I do think eventually we will see Nico Collins and it might not be this year, but next year, he's probably a top 15 to 18 type receiver in PPR leagues. Yeah. I think that both those guys are going to get steamed up. And then you talk about, you know, how fantasy managers want to build stacks and to have correlation in their teams, there's going to be more C.J. Stroud, Tank Dell, Nico Collins teams than than anyone. And we could throw Dalton Schultz into that mix too. He's been very successful, and he's not going to cost you that much. So we're already talking about redraft 2024. It's it's a lot of fun, Jim. And then I'll throw this out there. I have C.J. Stroud, who's having one of the best rookie seasons of all time, probably breaks Andrew Luck's record for yardage at this point. I think that would be a reasonable bet unless he has an injury like there's a chance that Houston makes a priority to go sign a, a free agent or drafts a, another receiver on like day two and they just say you know what this is the how we're going to attack you the Bobby Sloak offense is three wide receivers all the time let's add another one in the mix so we don't know how this is going to look it could be very very scary next year what a turnaround uh, organizationally and we've got to give some credit to Another team, and that's the Baltimore Ravens. Baltimore Ravens, this past offseason, they make the decision to, to get off of uh, Greg Roman as offensive coordinator. Obviously, it seemed like a difficult decision from Harbaugh, uh, who had a lot of history with Roman. Roman was obviously the offensive coordinator during the rise of Lamar Jackson. There's stagnation. They struggle to score. They make a change. Now you're seeing the Todd Munkin offense, which took some very big steps forward and then lost Mark Andrews. Game one with no Mark Andrews, the Ravens won a Ravens-like game. Their defense shined. They completely shut down the Chargers, 20-10 to 10 win. They only passed for 177 yards, but they had nearly 200 rushing yards, and they did it in a number of ways. It's still kind of difficult to decipher what this offense is going to be for the rest of the season. You have Baltimore now on the bye week, but I'm curious your thoughts Let's start out with Zay Flowers. Zay Flowers uh, get catches five passes, gets eight targets, uh, gets a touchdown. Uh, very low yardage, a lot of uh, stuff along uh, around the line of scrimmage. But then he also gets a rushing attempt, and he scores a touchdown on that. So to me, is Zay Flowers the biggest winner from the Mark Andrews injury? You know, I call Zay Flowers the screen king. Obviously, you know, he goes downfield some, but he's been heavily utilized there. And I do, as we get these divisional rematches, they're likely to have down the stretch. Deep the teams in their division have seen him already. It's going to be difficult to see if he has another answer or if the, you know, the coaches at Todd Munkin has a different answer for him. Because if that's the way they're going to consistently use him, good defenses can kind of limit that. Uh, again, they get him downfield for an occasional explosive, but. Mark Andrews, the loss, this is very difficult because he was their explosive, consistent element in the middle of the field. That opened up the offense. Now, I know Odell Beckham is still considered a downfield threat, and he's drawn some pass interference calls, and he's had a few big plays, but he seems to be limping every once every few series, yeah. so we don't know how much longer he's going to go. So here's what I believe the biggest winner right now is. I think it's Keaton Mitchell, and it seems that Munkin and John Harbaugh realized without Andrews in the lineup, we lost a lot of explosiveness. And again, I get Flowers is explosive, but it's in the shorter area. And you need to stretch a defense because defenses will come in and compress the field on you if they don't think there's a vertical threat to overcome that. Well, Keaton Mitchell is the one way they could add explosiveness into the offense. But I'm nervous about it because this is a crude comparison. But last year, we saw with the Cowboys, we saw Tony Pollard, going bananas, and we saw Zeke, Zeke Elliott doing as usual. Well, I felt like the defense plays to the speed of the lead guy, and we've seen this for years. The change of pace guy comes in and cleans up. Keaton Mitchell had 46% of the snaps, which was more than the 27% of Edwards and 28 of Justice Hill. But if Mitchell's the lead guy and defenses are playing to the speed of him as the lead back, it may be counterproductive. If they use him strategically as the counter punch to Gus Edwards, I think more explosive plays would come. But again, they need the explosive. So it's it's one of these riddles that they have to figure out on their bye week. 
but they have to get that speed in the game because they are going to struggle against compressed defenses now. He is Jim Coventry of Rotowire. Love the Keaton Mitchell uh, take. And again, I think that this offense, you also have like a couple of like Rashad Bateman starting to see a higher snap share. Isaiah likely gets six targets. There's, I think that they're still tinkering with this offense, and it's definitely one that we want to keep an eye on. But I do think that Keaton Mitchell in the flex moving forward is fine. And I think Zay Flowers locked in wide receiver two just based on the game planning for him. Uh, so this is definitely an offense to keep an eye on uh, when we return from bye weeks. And speaking of bye weeks, no team has had a bigger offensive turnover in a positive way post bye week than the Dallas Cowboys. The narrative at first was, oh my gosh, look at C.D. Lamb. C.D. Lamb is doing historically great things here. C.D. Lamb, of course, had the three straight games with 150 uh, yards receiving and 10-plus uh, catches. First player in NFL history to do that. But now the narrative has shifted. I mean, we're still, C.D. Lamb is still crushing it. But the narrative seems to have shifted to Dak Prescott. And how could it not? Dak Prescott goes, the game before the bye week, uh, Dak ends up having a strong game for fantasy, kind of like a, a, a sigh of relief for Dak managers who were considering benching him at that point, where he starts the year out with you know uh, five straight weeks of minimal production. And a couple of those games were not his fault. The defense was just completely demoralizing mm -hmm. people. You think about that Jets game, that Giants game, there was no opportunities for Dak, but then the Arizona game was like rock bottom. Now they go into the bye week, and it's been ridiculous. The first game back, 300 yards, then a 370 passing yard game, a 400 passing yard game. The Carolina game, they're completely in control, really no need to do anything. And then this, this Thanksgiving, one of the most disrespectful and cocky and awesome things I've ever seen an NFL player do was Dak Prescott eating a turkey leg with a lot of game to go. I think John Madden would have loved that one. But Dak <laughs> has been QB1 overall from weeks 8 through 12, and there's really no sign of slowing down. You're starting to see other Dallas Cowboys receivers making plays. How excited are you for Dak Prescott rest of the season, Jim? Yeah, the excitement level is through the roof. And what I think happened, especially in the bye week, Mike McCarthy came into the season. He did want to run the ball. He wanted to keep his defense off the field. I believe that was his vision. It was limiting the passing game attempt. But the Dallas Cowboys do not have a sustaining rushing attack. Tony Pollard has not been a sustainer. He's been about four yards per carry. Rico Dowdle, not the guy you're going to put on the, the offense on your on his back. I think they realized, and even Brian Schottheimer is the offensive coordinator, they really had to be like gritting their teeth, but they realized the only way they're going to keep up offensively is if they lean on the passing game and use the running game in a secondary capacity. And they have turned it over to Dak Prescott. And Dak Prescott's a great processor, reads defenses extremely well, gets to his checks very quickly. But like you mentioned, they also figured out how best to deploy C.D. Lamb. Don't just use him in a slot. Use him outside as well. Move him around. Make him a player that defenses are not going to be able to keep up with because you don't know where he's going to be at all times. And then with that, everything else builds off it. Brandon Cooks finds more space. There's more room in the, for Jake Ferguson in the middle of the field. So this will continue, and Dak will ride his three weapons, and this is going to be a great end of the season for him. Yeah, and what a narrative change. You had all these kind of like talking heads being so critical of Dak Prescott early in the season – uh, you know, you saw like guys on like ESPN and NFL Network. You didn't really have that sort of panic with fantasy analysts. We just know more than those guys, I think, at this point, Jim. Uh, we're deep there in the streets. And, you know, we're, we're recording this on Tuesday. So a lot of people are putting in waivers tonight or on Wednesday. And one guy who's available on waivers is Curtis Samuel. Has a very big game on Thanksgiving Day. The game flow helped him a little bit and I think the fact that the Dallas Cowboys defense was getting so much pressure on Sam Howell that maybe the lower a dot option of Samuel was there for him but I'm adding Curtis Samuel this week where he's available um, I'm not like thrilled about it but I just think it's a poor week for waivers and I I have at least a commodity where I have an expectation that he's going to produce where are you on Curtis Samuel 
um, and what you saw on Thanksgiving Day. Was this an aberration or a guy that you want to get in your flex spot this week? So, first of all, Curtis Samuel has a week 14 bye. So, those who are picking him up are really eyeballing this week. And we'll talk about the Miami matchup. And I think you're right on this one, Theo. Curtis Samuel, so how he's been utilized. So, we know that Sam Howell will take too many hits, hold the ball to them. But Eric Bieniemy about a month ago, really made a fundamental shift. He made it a point to get pass routes out quickly. So, we see... Howell's getting the ball out much faster. He's taking less hits, taking less sacks. Well, when you're playing last week a game against Dallas, they realize the pressure that Dallas brings. So the answer to that is getting the ball out quickly in the middle of the field because Dallas plays one of the highest rate of man coverage in the league. And so they're going to press up those receivers. And if the pressure is coming fast, you don't have a window to throw. Against zone, you do. The middle of the field was going to be the play. I thought Logan Thomas would have the big game. He did a little bit, but it was the middle of the field to Curtis Samuel that got it done. This week is more of the same. Now, I know Miami lost Jalen Phillips. That's a huge loss, but they still have enough pass rush to get to them. But the thing with Miami is, it's the Vic Fangio defense. They are playing zone. They're playing more of a shell. They don't want to give up explosives. They do give you the middle of the field. This is a great setup for Curtis Samuel. Yeah, I'm 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 excited for it. And sticking with Miami on the opposite side of the ball, I think we could talk about Raheem Mostert's season, but I think every every podcast is doing that. Mostert is four touchdowns away from breaking Ricky Williams' uh record for most rushing touchdowns as a Miami Dolphin. Wild, another guy that we got to talk about this offseason is Mostert. Um, but my takeaway with Miami that I want to get your opinion on is it seems like we're kind of beginning to see similar pass as last season. Last season, we had Jalen Waddell and Tyreek Hill with this incredible target share. They had, I believe, like a 52% target share for the season, easily the highest target share for any two players uh, in the entire league last year. They go to play Kansas City in Germany, get smacked. It's 21-7, and basically Mostert falls in the end zone to make it a 21-14 game. Then they go they go on their bye week and come back and they beat a kind of a plucky, difficult to beat Las Vegas Raiders team. But we started to see the target shares collectively go up. I believe they were like 52%, 53% target share uh, against Las Vegas with Hill and Waddle combined. Now on Black Friday, where they played the Jets, the passing volume was not high, but we had a 72% target share for Hill and Waddle was in complete consolidation and both of the players put up very big fantasy games. Is this something moving forward that we're going to see from this Miami team, Jim, where it's complete consolidation and then the rest of the touches are all running back touches? How excited basically should Jalen Waddle managers be? So Jalen Waddle, we know the speed of the talent is very, very high, but he hasn't had massive production. He had the hundred yard game against the Jets. Uh, Prior game, four for 55, three for 42 before that. So I don't know that he has been optimized this year in the offense. Last year, I thought they did a better job of getting him more explosive routes. But here's the problem. Waddle can get downfield. The emphasis has been on Tua getting it out quickly. One of the fastest release times of passing the football in the league. And I think that that has taken away some of the downfield part of Waddle's game. It's Tyreek Hill when the play breaks down and two is in scramble mode, those deep passes go there. So Waddle is going to be heavily reliant on yards after the catch, and we're not seeing it to the level we saw it last year. So I think he has a great floor, but even in the red zone, it seems to be mostly about Tyreek Hill. Now, and the running backs, Waddle gets to touchdowns occasionally, but I think he has a little lower of a floor than we like and not quite as high of a ceiling. He's still a great wide receiver too, but those down weeks are tough. This week against Washington, Jim, Jalen Waddle, 150 receiving yards. I'm yeah. flag planning it. And then next week, a, a matchup where a lot of pressure on that Tennessee offense to kind of play keep up. That game could quickly get away from Tennessee. You could see Jalen Waddle getting behind that defense as well. So I'm going to be a little more optimistic about Jalen Waddle quickly. Drake London had his best fantasy performance since week six, obviously had some injuries where he missed some time, but he gets a five catch 90 yard game. 
obviously Bijan Robinson, we feel thrilled about. The usage is completely there. He smashed. But are you looking at Drake London, a guy who really had a strong end of the season last year, kind of on that similar path this year as well? Or should we kind of temper expectations? I, look, Drake London would be a superstar if he was in the right situation. And the fact that they, they can't get him ceiling games. Atlanta's not scoring enough points. Uh, they're not making a priority to pass in the red zone, especially to wide receivers. And I just think London is a floor play at this point. I don't see the ceiling games. Yeah, he had the 96 yards. It was nice, but that was far from a ceiling game. That's kind of, you'd hope you'd have six or seven of those in a season for a receiver of London's caliber. So he's a great player just trapped in what right now is a system that's not working and they're not winning games. And so you think that they would fix this. I don't know how much they trust Desmond Ritter. I really do think they need to hide him as much as possible. And we've seen as a result, Bijan Robinson's usage has gone way up the last couple of weeks and they still are doubling down on the run game because obviously, like I said, you can't put the team on Ritter's back. Ritter is awful. I mean, I've, 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 I know we've had some 300 yard passing games this season, but he's just a very limited quarterback. It'll be very interesting to see kind of what Drake London does next year. You got to figure that there's a change at the quarterback position coming. You know, you have multiple guys that are going to be drafted in the top 10. Usually that leads to a couple of displaced starters. Hopefully Atlanta gets one, gets them and we see some Drake London breakout in year three. Um, we could spend 20 minutes on the Buffalo Philadelphia game. Uh, it was unbelievable game to watch 37, 34 win for Philadelphia quarterbacks one and two on the week with Jalen Hurts and Josh Allen. My big takeaway was Devonta Smith continues to smash. You're going to see Devonta Smith uh, probably closer to his 2022 points per game scoring moving forward. Even when Dallas Goddard returns, I don't really anticipate Devonta Smith kind of getting put back in, in the bag. Has a seven catch, 106 yards and a touchdown performance. Uh, that was kind of, for me, the biggest takeaway. Is there a fantasy takeaway for you from either side of the ball, Jim? Well, I even thought two weeks ago that Devontae Smith was in for an upturn. It was because Dallas Goddard's out. When defenses approach Philly, look, Dallas Goddard might not have gaudy numbers, but every defensive coordinator knows the damage he could do if you don't put proper attention on him. And there's basically three players he had to worry about. He had to worry about A.J. Brown. He had to worry about Goddard. He had to worry about Devontae Smith. Well, when one of them is out, it's a completely different scenario. Now it's like, okay, we know Devontae Smith's great, but we have to slow down A.J. Brown. And we saw a concerted effort to put extra attention on him because without Dallas Goddard, go ahead, Jack Stoll or Alameda Zacchaeus, who did score a touchdown, or Julio Jones, fine, whatever. We're taking out A.J. Brown. So the result was that Devontae Smith had favorable situations, and they were certainly going to throw him. He's a star. Throw him the ball. Dallas Goddard's pushing the play this week. When he comes back, defenses will not be able to allocate the same resources on, on A.J. Brown they had. A.J. Brown is going to get his. A.J. Brown, it, look, we have Tyreek Hill. We have Justin Jefferson. We have, and I'm missing one of the big four, and um, Jamar Chase, and we have A.J. Brown. They are all the best receiver in the league. They're tied. They do it in different ways. A.J. Brown is getting his. They are not going away from him, but if a defense could take him away, they have to. That won't happen when Goddard's back. I, I love it. Um, you know, we had so much to talk about on the show sheet, Jim, but we're, we're, we're hitting almost our time limit here. You've been very generous with your time and your takes. You know, Jim, you talked about a number of players that maybe you have some concerns about. You know, we talked about Cooper Cup. We've talked about some guys that you're very excited about for the fantasy playoffs. Um, why don't we start out with a guy that you're very excited, excited about, whether it has to do with their schedule or it has to do with kind of their role. Who's the guy that you're really leaning on that you're really, really stoked about having in your lineup for the fantasy playoffs? You, you know, I mean, it, it's old and boring, but it's Mike Evans. Yeah, love it. Tampa Bay is very good at pass protection. When they played the 49ers, okay, fine. Baker Mayfield is under duress, but they played the 49ers. Every other week, he has enough time to throw, but he has made it a priority to get the ball to Evans. And Evans has had some drops and some misplays, but for the most part, Evans gets it done almost every week. And Tampa's defense, they have some names, but they are allowing points on the board, so they have to throw every week. So Mike Evans, I'm really excited about him rest of schedule. I, I love Mike Evans, and that's another one we'll talk about this offseason. He has his first two-touchdown game this past week. 
He's scoring a touchdown every single week, like you said, Jim. Starts out the season with three straight games with a touchdown. Defenses know it's coming, and they can't stop it. Chris Godwin looks like he's complete dust. Basically, defenses know that the ball is going to Mike Evans and Rashad White, and that's it. They had a little bit of Kate Otten mixed in, and obviously a little Godwin mixed in. So uh, Mike Evans, if you have him, he's wide receiver nine on the season. I think he could finish inside the top five at the wide receiver spot. Um, Got to be excited about Mike Evans. For me, I'm excited about Josh Jacobs, and I know that they have the bye week this week, but he's had uh, he had 20 carries, 110 yards this past week. He had his highest yards per carry of the entire season, and he gave you four catches. In weeks 9 and 10, he gave you a 26 and 27 carry week. This is like the new Las Vegas Raiders uh, identity, where Antonio Pierce has done everything he can to talk up Josh Jacobs, wants him to be a Raider for life. Now they have the bye week. I think that the bye week is, uh, okay, Josh Jacobs, get a little rest, and when you come back, we're getting right after it. Minnesota Vikings, L.A. Chargers, two winnable games, Man. both at home in Vegas. Then they play that same Chiefs team on the road in Week 16, then Indianapolis Week 17. I'm excited about Josh Jacobs. I think Josh Jacobs is firmly in the mix for top five running back rest of the season. Anything that they can do to get him the ball, they're going to do it. Now, we talked about Evans. We talked about Josh Jacobs. Time, I guess, is a flat circle, Jim. We don't need to really think in the offseason. Just draft guys with past fantasy production. Get yourself a Jacobs in and Evans, like those boring picks. Nobody in your league will say, awesome pick, Jim. But both of those guys are paying off right now. Now, you talked about Cup. You gave us one earlier. Who's another guy that you're getting a little bit worried about rest of the season? Oh, man, top of my head. I wasn't even thinking about this question, any particular one player. But I, I mean, can I'm start a... out if you want. If you like, uh, For me, I'm really worried about this Bengals offense. Jamar Chase, I know we're starting, but you know, Jamar Chase could have me or you at quarterback, and we're still going to start him in any time in our fantasy lineups because he's Jamar Chase. But to go from like the 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 stats from this past week for Chase could have been even worse. He caught like two deflected balls that could have gone uh, opposite ways. I mean, he ends up with with only six targets and he catches four of them for 80 yards. He's giving you essentially wide receiver three numbers and that's Pittsburgh. They'll he'll have a couple of decent games, but I think that the quality of the Cincinnati Bengals offense without Joe Burrow going down to Jake Browning, Jamar Chase is like a low end wide receiver two as painful as that is for me to say, despite his immense talent, I just don't have any real hopes for this Bengals offense. And I think that that's like, it's almost worse than a guy you talked about, like with Cup, where Cup, you potentially could have a situation where, you know, maybe you have a, a red hot rookie, maybe you have a Rasheed Rice on your team, maybe you have a viable alternative to start him. Jamar Chase, it's almost worse because you have to start him. You just have to kind of roll with the punches knowing that your first round pick is now a wide receiver too because of the quality of the offense. I'm worried about Travis Etienne. Early in the season, it was 80, 88% snap share. He was getting 22 plus touches a game. Coming out of the week nine bye, not even close. He's about 63, 64% of the snaps. Uh, Dearness Johnson's heavily involved. And the problem for Etienne is the run blocking is horrific. And with him getting, now I know he had 20 carries last week. It was the kind of the way that game went, but he had 14 and nine the two prior weeks. What the lower carries does to him, it limits his ability to hit big plays. The less It's like lottery tickets. The less chances you have, the less chance you have to hit. Well, that's the problem. The big plays aren't coming because he's not getting enough attempts to do it. And even in the receiving game, He's been catching the ball, but earlier in the season, we were seeing yardage. But since the bye, we have a nine yard, a seven yard. He did get 30 on four catches last week. So, and he's not finding the end zone early in the season, multiple times, three game drought. I don't know that it's changing and he's getting less work. Difficult times, tough times. Uh, you know, the, I think that the big takeaway for everybody moving forward for the playoffs, the best advice I could give for fantasy playoff football is, when you draft guys in August, it's a seasonal game. Fantasy football is always a weekly game, but you're still drafting with a seasonal trajectory. When you get to the fantasy playoffs, don't have the fear of benching a guy. If you hate the matchup, go down swinging. 
be be very very cautious with your sit starts because there is really no tomorrow in single elimination uh fantasy football the yesterday's price is not today's price teams change situations change don't be afraid to put a red hot guy into the lineup don't be afraid to put a guy in who's going to get excessive volume versus a guy who's maybe scored for you early in the season it becomes more and more of a weekly game the further we get into the season do you have any fantasy advice with your years of expertise, yeah. Jim, to dole out to fantasy managers as they make their playoff runs? Well, I, I know like ESPN League still have their trade window open. If you still have a trade window open, if you're in a league where you have a really good bench where you're like starting caliber players and you don't know who to start, if you can package up a couple of producing players for an upgrade to your starting position, your roster – that's a move I'm willing to take every time. If you know you're in the playoffs, and yeah, we're always taking risks with injuries, but shorten your bench if you can improve your starting lineup to make sure, because look, it takes some luck to win in the fantasy playoffs. But if you increase the ability of your starting lineup, it puts you in a decreased luck scenario. Depth does not matter nearly as much when you have only a couple of weeks to play. Jim, this was awesome today. I love doing it. Let everybody know where they can find your great work. You can find me at the X at Jim Coventry NFL, and that's the hub where everything is at. So just make it easy. Yeah, highly recommend Jim's work. Highly recommend the the work that you guys put out at RotoWire. It's very very good stuff. Um, check out First Class Fantasy. Billy Muzio and I are going to be recording at three thirty Eastern time on Thursday, and then Friday I'm with your boy Alan Soslowski yes. and the Podfather for the Sonic Truth Dynasty podcast. I believe we're going at ten thirty in the morning Eastern time. I uh, check out player profiler Twitter to confirm that. And then Friday afternoon, uh, my dynasty podcast, dynasty life, which is basically the dynasty version of press coverage. I have Scott Connor of dynasty trades in five uh, coming on. Scott's one of the best out there when it comes to, to discussing dynasty. So definitely check us out, check out my waiver wire article that drops uh, today, right on playerprofiler.com. And uh, everybody, it's time to get after it. Let's, uh, Take a little extra time with your lineups. Take a little extra time with your waiver wires. You know, before you know it, this thing is going to be over and it's going to be the off season. Put everything you have into it. Jim Coventry, check him out at Rotowire. And uh, we'll check you guys later. Have a great rest of the week. Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in. It's important to me that all of our media be free. This is only possible because of you allowing a true independent sports media enterprise to thrive unlike any other in the business. So please subscribe to the All-In Package to continue to make all this possible to ensure that all of our stats, information, data, content is available to you, especially you, the people that get the site and get the show.